for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, our Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Friday evening, August the 15th, 1969. Christ for the Nation Seminar, Dallas, Texas. This tape was with Dr. Derek Prince speaking on the inheritance of the saints in light. This is service seven of nine. Brother Derek Prince, we're very happy to have him here tonight to minister to us again. Dear Lord, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus, thanking you that we're gathered in that name and that we have access to you through his name and through his blood, which was shed on the cross for our sins. Lord, we acknowledge our total dependence upon thee, that without thee we can do nothing. It is not by might nor by power, but by thy spirit. And so, Lord, just take charge now of me, my thoughts, my words. May they glorify thee. May the words that come out be the fulfillment of thy will for this meeting, and may they meet the needs of thy people, and may the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ be uplifted. And we'll be careful, Lord, in everything to give thee the praise and the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I feel that my part as a preacher in this seminar could really rather be described in the words of the poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson, which probably isn't familiar to many Americans, about the brook. I don't suppose that this is included in your educational background nowadays, but Tennyson was a very well-known Victorian poet in England, and he wrote a poem called The Brook, and one of the stanzas in the poem goes like this, Men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. And uh, I feel rather like this about my preaching, because people have come and people have gone, but I've stuck to my theme. And I realize that there are a good number here tonight that haven't heard a single one of the previous messages in this theme, but I still believe that the Spirit of God would have me to continue with the theme of Colossians. We have spoken in this theme about the inheritance of the saints, God's people, in light. An inheritance which is altogether glorious which has no shadow, no sorrow, no defeat, no weakness. In every respect, spiritual, intellectual, physical, material, it's good. God has prepared nothing but the best for his people. We went into the analysis of some of the words that were used by Paul in the first 12 verses of the first chapter, and we saw that there was not one breath of the negative anywhere in the entire passage. It is an inheritance that is entirely in light. There is no darkness in it anywhere. And then we went on to speak about the further revelation of Paul in relation to the person and the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I did come to the point on the other afternoon where I had announced that I was going to speak to you about the last Adam and the second man. But I got diverted into the relationship between spirit, soul, and body. And I did announce that I would come back to the theme about the last Adam and the second man. And I still intend to do this, but not tonight. Looking at the program, I find I have one more period tomorrow. And I'm hoping to be able to conclude what I had to say there about the last Adam and the second man in that period tomorrow. But this evening, I feel the Lord would have to have me to speak about the cross. And there is no greater theme in the entire scriptures than the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, whereby the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For Paul, the cross was the end of one realm and the beginning of a new realm. And I, I did point out to you uh, briefly in one of my previous messages that the cross is the dividing line between the inheritance of the saints in light and the power of darkness, which is the realm of Satan's authority. 
No darkness can get beyond the cross. The cross is God's great stop sign to Satan. And when that great red stop sign looms up in front of him, he puts on his brakes and skids to a stop because he cannot get beyond the cross. And the vital question in every life is, on which side of the cross are you living? Are you living on the side of the light, or are you still in the realm of darkness? I pointed out to you that Paul very rightly and objectively states that darkness has power. The devil has power. He's not an unreal entity. He's not a fiction of medieval imagination. He's a real person, a very powerful person, and a very terrible person, and a very cunning person. Now, I am not preaching fear of the devil if you're right with God. If you're right with God, you don't need to fear the devil. But if you're not right with God, believe me, you need to fear the devil. Yes. There's no doubt about that. Jesus said to his disciples, Fear not him, them, which kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. I will show you whom ye shall fear. Fear him who after he hath killed, hath power, and the word is authority, to destroy both soul and body in hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And Jesus was speaking without a shadow of a doubt about the devil. Because the words kill and destroy are used also in the 10th chapter and the 10th verse of John's Gospel, where Jesus is definitely speaking about the devil, and he says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill, and to destroy. And you have been served notice by the Lord and by me here tonight that if the devil occupies any area of your life, if he has any access to any part of your personality, he only comes to do three things. He has no other purpose or objective. He cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He steals, he takes away that which is rightfully yours in God, that which God provided for you, he steals from you. Such as your health, your peace of mind, the blessings of your family, financial prosperity. All these things which God has ordained for you to have, if you allow the devil to come into your life, he'll steal them from you. And some of you know that well. And some of you here this evening are in the condition where the devil is already stealing these things from you, and not a few of them, maybe he has already stolen. And it is not too soon for you to awake to his identity and to his activity. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy to steal in this life every good thing that God has for you. If you allow the devil to have his way in your life, ultimately he will beggar you completely. You'll be beggared spiritually, beggared mentally, beggared physically, and beggared financially. That's what the devil intends to do. He will kill you. He will terminate your physical life. He was a murderer, Jesus said, from the beginning. And as a matter of fact, in a certain sense, every person who has ever died has been murdered by the devil. He's responsible in the last resort for the death of every person who has ever died. He has murdered billions and billions of people. But the most terrible fact of all is this, that when he is killed, that is not the end. For he will also destroy. And with the word destroy, Jesus takes us beyond time into eternity. And you remember the other passage I quoted to you? Fear him, which after he hath killed, hath power, authority given him by God, to destroy both soul and body in hell. And the word is Gehenna. It is not Sheol. It is not the place of temporary imprisonment before judgment. It is the place of final, unending 
punishment. And the only barrier between you and the devil's devices against you, the only place of refuge, the only way of escape, is through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to read part of the words that Paul gives us in Colossians in relation to the cross. And as my good legal friend said, he gave you his legal testimony, which... I was so happy, and I'm going to quote to you the textbook. I'm not going to try to add a great deal of eloquence to the textbook. I'm simply going to try to to tell you just what it actually says. In the twelfth verse of the first chapter of Colossians, and some of you have heard me read this already several times, we read these words, giving thanks unto the Father, who hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life, made us capable. We do not fail to enter into it because we are incapable, because God in Christ has made us capable. If we do not enter into it, it is not because we are incapable, but possibly because we are ignorant, or possibly because we are unwilling to meet the conditions. But it is possible for us to enter into the inheritance of the saints in life. We will not be able to say to God, well, God, you set before me something that I could not enter into, because God has made us capable of entering into the inheritance of the saints in life. And then we have this statement which reveals the only way into this inheritance in the 13th and 14th verses, who hath delivered us from the power or authority of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And notice four key words there. The word delivered, which begins it. We have to be delivered. In the natural, we are the slaves of Satan. Paul said, and yet he was a good religious Jew, Jew, I am carnal, sold under sin. By his carnal nature, he was a slave awaiting purchase in the slave market of the devil. That phrase, sold under sin, is a metaphor from the time of the Roman Empire when when the Roman troops had fought a successful campaign, apart from their wages which they received, the soldiers were allowed to take prisoners of war and in order to increase their financial gains, they were allowed to sell them in the slave markets of the ancient world. But... As just an example from history, after the defeat and destruction of Jerusalem and the Jewish state by Titus in the year 70 AD, so many Jewish slaves were put for sale on on the market that slaves lost their value. There was a glut. There were too many slaves. No one wanted slaves anymore. This was the result of the overthrow of the Jewish nation in 70 AD. Jesus had warned them. In the 21st chapter of Luke's Gospel, you find his words of warning. However, when a Roman soldier had a prisoner of war, a man or a woman, and whom he wanted to sell in the slave market, it was arranged that the person for sale would stand in a certain, on a certain little platform. And incidentally, you know, uh, this is not, of course, entirely so far remote in human history because slaves were sold in East Africa and other parts of Africa until fairly recently. And on the island of Zanzibar, where there was a slave market not more than a century ago, the first Christian missionary church was built. That's rather a testimony to what the gospel will do. Well, when a slave was to be sold stood on this little platform and a spear was stuck out over his head. And in the Latin language, the word for to sell a slave is to sell somebody under the spear. And this meant to be sold into slavery. And when anybody walked into the market and saw this person, man or woman, standing there on the little platform with a spear thrust out over their head, they knew immediately this person was for sale. 
And anybody could go up and examine them, see how strong they were, how healthy they were, how many years of labor they could be expected to contribute, whether they would be useful as a domestic servant or maybe in agriculture or maybe if it was a young pretty woman whether she would do well as a prostitute and then they decided how much they would pay and of course as a slave the person purchased had no choice whatever concerning what purpose or task they would be allotted to a woman was bought for prostitution a prostitute she became a man was bought for household work. Household work was what he did. He had no choice. Now, when Paul says, I am carnal, sold under sin, his mind was on that scene. And he pictures himself as a sinner standing there out in the slave market on the little platform with the spear thrust out over his hand. And the spear under which he was sold it was the sin he'd committed. And there he was for sale in the devil's slave market. And you see, this is true. You may be a good, respectable church sinner. But had your purchaser decided to make a prostitute out of you or a thief, yours would not have been the choice. But praise God, one day when I was standing there on the market, somebody walked into the market and he paid the full price and he bought me back and that's redemption it's to buy somebody back out of the devil's slave market the person who bought me was Jesus the price that he paid was his precious blood and so I can say now with Apostle Paul in the 14th verse in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sin this was achieved through the cross. There was no other way. Jesus had to die in my place. The sinner's substitute. The just for the unjust. That he might bring both you and me back to God. The price that was paid in the old covenant was a life for a life. And in Leviticus 17.11 the scripture says the life or the soul of all flesh is in the blood. And so to give his life, Jesus had to pour out his life blood. And in that outpoured blood, there was one life, the sinless, eternal, sacred life of the Son of God, which became the ransom for the souls of all men. The scripture is perfectly logical. It's not a matter of emotional frenzy. I know emotion can enter into it. But it will stand the most careful, logical scrutiny and analysis. It is perfectly logical. This is the price of redemption. The soul of the Son of God. It says in Isaiah the 53rd chapter, He poured out His soul unto death. He poured out His soul when He poured out His life blood to the very last drop upon the cross. And that was the price of of redemption. The Apostle Peter says, we are redeemed not with corruptible things as silver or gold from our vain conversation received by tradition from our fathers, but with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now I'm going to read a little further on. I'm selecting the passages that deal with the work of the cross. We move on to the 19th verse and following. For it pleased the Father that in him, Jesus, should all fullness dwell. And in the second chapter and the ninth verse, Paul returns to this theme and says, For in him, Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In the body of Jesus Christ, God was completely resident. Not partially, but totally. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself not imputing unto them their trespasses. The 20th verse, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, 
Now I want to pause here for a moment. I have no desire to be controversial, but I want everybody to know where I stand. There is a doctrine that has been called ultimate reconciliation, which claims that in the last resort, no matter how many ages away, all created beings will be reconciled back to God through Jesus Christ, including the devil and his fallen angels and the demons and all the wicked and ungodly dead that have perished. And this is based partly on this verse, to reconcile unto himself all things. Now I want to say very clearly that you may never misunderstand me, I do not believe that doctrine. And I do not believe it because the people that base it on this verse have missed the second part of the verse which says, By him I say, whether they be things in earth or whether they be things in heaven. There is a limit to the sphere of reconciliation and it is earth or heaven. Now, you do not turn, need to turn tonight, but if you care to look in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation, you will find that before, from the face of him that sat upon the great white throne, both earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. But there was still another area, another location, which was called the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. This was outside the confines of earth or heaven. And those who are consigned to the lake that burns with fire and brimstone are outside the confines of reconciliation with God. There is no way back from that terrible place. Jesus called it a place of everlasting punishment. Those are the words of the Lord Jesus himself. And in the same verse that he speaks of everlasting punishment for the wicked, he says the righteous shall go into everlasting life. And the same word, everlasting, is used of the light into which the righteous enter and the punishment into which the wicked are consigned. Now I believe that Jesus Christ gives to me as a believer a life in him which will never end. It is truly everlasting. And by the same token, I cannot but conclude that the punishment of those that reject the offer of God's mercy in Jesus Christ will be as fully everlasting as the life which is given to us in Christ. And in the book of Revelation, the 20th chapter, it says about those that are consigned to this lake, they will be tormented forever and ever. And that Greek word that's translated in the King James Version forever and ever is literally unto the ages of ages. And there is no phrase in the Greek language capable of expressing more clearly permanent and endless duration. The same phrase is used of the life of God himself, of the Holy Spirit, and of the praise and worship and honor which are due to God. And in my judgment, every one of those things is absolutely and completely endless. If the punishment of the wicked is not endless, then the life of God is not endless either. And you see what this doctrine does. It upgrades Satan and downgrades God until they're almost on the same level. And there's only one person behind that doctrine, and that's the one that's upgraded, Satan. Now I say this because I know for a fact that in many areas this doctrine is being disseminated today. Even by those whom I count as my personal friends, and whose names must undoubtedly be known to many of you here. At the close of the book of Revelation, the most solemn words are pronounced right at the end of that book, and I feel we should turn to them for a moment. The 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation, verses 18 and 19, and these words come from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. 
And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. One thing is clear, the book of Revelation is inviolable. You can neither add to it nor take away from it without suffering the most fearful judgments from Almighty God. And I would say that to take away from the words of, this, of the book of this prophecy falls exactly within the scope of what people do who deny that the word everlasting means everlasting. It is exactly that. It is to take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. And I believe, whether they be friends of mine or no, makes no difference, that unless they repent, their part will be taken away out of the book of life. And furthermore, I pray sincerely that it will never be laid to my charge that I could have ever deceived people as to their eternal destiny. I cannot think of a more solemn responsibility than that. Now, I am not speaking idly. If you have not encountered this teaching, if you move in what is called charismatic circles, it is not likely to be long before you do. We can talk about love, and the scripture says God is love. Thank God he is. But be on your guard when you meet anybody that builds their entire doctrine on one verse of the Bible. They've always got something to cover up. If all that God needed to say could be said in one verse, then it wouldn't have been necessary to write the rest of the book. In my opinion, the Bible is a remarkably compact and succinct revelation anyhow. And I don't believe in omitting the meaning of, of a single verse. I listened to a lady preaching, and after a little while I gathered that she believed this doctrine to which I'm referring. She didn't come at it directly, but she was moving at it. And uh, she was harping on the theme that God is love. God is love, that's true. God is also light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. God is also a just God. He says, I am a just God and a saviour Beside me there is none other. We have the choice whether we will accept God's justice or whether we will accept his salvation. One or the other is the lot of every human soul. Paul says in Romans, the 11th chapter, Behold therefore the goodness and the severity of God. And speaking to Christians, he says, On thee, if thou continue to believe, goodness, but if thou fall away, thou also shalt be cut off. Amen. To me this is clear. There is no reason to be under any uncertainty as to what the Bible teaches. This particular lady then told us that she found the book of Revelation a mystery. In my opinion, the reason why she found it a mystery was not because she couldn't understand it, but because she didn't want to understand it. An Episcopal bishop, a former Episcopal bishop, Bishop Pike, made publicly the pronouncement that he could not accept the picture of two contending gods, that is, God and the devil. I think he should have changed one word. Not I cannot, but I will not. What you believe is a decision. You can decide to believe God, or you can decide not to believe God. That's why unbelief, in a certain sense, is the most damning sin. At the end of the fourth chapter of Hebrews, it's stated that the children of Israel could not enter into the promised land because of one thing, and that was unbelief. They had committed idolatry and fornication. They'd been guilty of murmuring and complaining. They'd been guilty of many sins along the way. None of those sins barred the way into the promised land. The sin that kept them out 
was unbelief. People do not understand this because they do not realize that what you believe is a decision. The Bible says, He that receiveth the testimony of God concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, hath the witness of its truth in himself. He that believeth not God hath made God a liar, because he receiveth not the record that he hath given concerning his Son. And when the gospel is truly preached, every person has to make a decision. Neutrality is excluded. You either believe God, or you reject God's testimony, and you make him a liar. And of all the fearful crimes of which men can be guilty, I cannot think of anything more terrible than to make Almighty God a liar. It is done by a decision of the will. It is not done in ignorance. It is not done in innocence. And we are answerable for what we believe. Concerning the very same lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which was revealed to John in the book of Revelation, he saw eight categories of persons consigned to that lake. You'll find this in the 21st chapter and the 8th verse, the book of Revelation. And the first two categories were the fearful and the unbelieving. They went in ahead of the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the liars, the murderers, the abominable, and all the others that were consigned thereto. It is a fearful thing to be amongst the fearful and the unbelieving. Now I'm going on because I'm just moving through the statements that Paul makes about the cross in this epistle, not dwelling too long on any of them. In verse 21 of the first chapter and verse 22, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Paul then turns to the personal experience of the Colossian Christians, and he reminds them that they had experienced the reconciliation with God through Jesus Christ and through the cross. He reminds them that they were, though they were no different from other sinners of other different ages or backgrounds, they had been alienated from God, cut off from God, strangers to God, and that they had been God's enemies in their mind, in their mental attitude, and that this enmity to God had expressed itself in the wicked works which they had committed. And remember that sin begins with an attitude and is expressed in action, but it is the attitude that is primary, the action which is secondary. In the 8th chapter of Romans, Paul says, the carnal mind, the mind of the natural unregenerate person, whether he be a communist or a Baptist or a Catholic, if he be not regenerated, the carnal mind is enmity against God. Is it, it is at war with God. It's related of your great well-known writer, Thoreau, that a relative, who was presumably a Christian, once asked him if he had made his peace with God, to which he replied, I didn't know that we had quarreled. Well, he was ignorant. You see, the carnal mind does not even know that it's at enmity with God. It's so totally alienated to God that it doesn't even know its correct attitude towards God. One tremendous test, the carnal mind, is the use of the word Jesus. I wonder whether you've ever experienced that. As a soldier in the British Army, I was converted in the first year of my military service, and I spent another four and a half years, or nearly five years, in the British forces. And I discovered, in an army barrack room, you could talk about God in a general way, and people would hardly turn around. You begin to talk about Christ, and people get a little embarrassed. But you talk about Jesus, and everybody else stops talking. They're acutely embarrassed. That's the reaction of the carnal mind coming out into the open. And you will find in multitudes of our churches today Christians that would cringe if you talk to them about Jesus. 
doesn't matter if you talk about the master, the teacher, the Lord, but when you use that precious sacred name, Jesus, there's a reaction. And if there's anything in you that gets churned up at the mention of the name Jesus, that's the carnal mind. And it's laying bare its enmity against God and against his Christ. But thank God there is reconciliation. Those of us who were at war with God can be brought into a relationship of perfect peace and harmony with Almighty God through the cross because Jesus on the cross was identified with our sinful nature. In Romans 6 and 6 it says, Our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Jesus was made sin, it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, with our sinfulness, that we might be made righteous with his righteousness. In Romans 8.4 it says, God condemned sin in the flesh. And that was in the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ, on the cross. 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bare our sins, in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. There is no other place in time or eternity, or in any remote area of this universe, where God solved the sin problem and made possible reconciliation with the sinner except through the cross. On the cross, Jesus became the sinner's substitute. He took the world's sin upon him. He received the punishment of that sin, he paid the penalty in full, and before he died, he gave that glorious triumphant try, cry, it is finished. It was in the body of his flesh, through death, there was no other way. And he did it that he might present us, Paul says, holy and unblameable and unreprovable in the sight of God. If you ever try to approach Almighty God in your own righteousness, no matter how hard you've worked at it, how long you've prayed, how many ordinances and rituals of the church you have gone through, you will come into the presence of God with a sense of fear and condemnation. You will never have the assurance that you're holy and unblameable and unreprovable in the sight of Almighty God. But if you come in the name of Jesus, if you come through the blood of Jesus, if you come through the finished work of the cross, if you come not laying claim to your own righteousness, which is as filthy rags in the sight of Almighty God, but if you'll come with the righteousness of Christ received through faith, not by your deserts, but by your believing, you can stand holy and unblameable and unreprovable in the sight of Almighty God. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, the Scripture says. This is almost unbelievable. There is no condemnation. It has been said by several, E.W. Kenyon was one and others, that the church has got so bogged down in guilt that it doesn't recognize what it is to feel guiltless. And I believe this is true. Until recently, and with a few exceptions, mainly the hymns, I would say, of the Wesley brothers, most of our hymns majored on the theme of sin, and guilt. That Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict the world of sin. But thank God he didn't stop there. He said, and of righteousness. It's good to be convicted of your sin if it leads you to repentance, and you be convicted of your righteousness in Christ. God is not in the business of making people feel guilty. Did you know that? The very startling statement. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing unto them their trespasses, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We are therefore ambassadors for Christ. Our ministry is not to condemn people, not to make them feel guilty. That was under the law. In the Second Corinthians chapter 3, it says the ministry of condemnation was glorious, how much more should the ministry of righteousness be glorious? We are not ministering condemnation to people. We are called to minister righteousness to people. If anybody makes you feel guilty and miserable, do you know who it is? The devil. 
It's his job. God never makes people feel guilty. And another thing I'll tell you, the Holy Spirit never discourages the people of God. He is the comforter, the encourager. If you were a child of God and there's any voice that ever speaks to you, beating you down, discouraging you, telling you you're a failure, telling you you'll never make it, telling you that others can but you can't, that is the voice of the devil. People come to me so many times, as they must do to other preachers, and they say, Brother Prince, the devil keeps telling me, and he, they come out with all the miserable lies the devil has been feeding them with. And my reaction is, if you know it's the devil that keeps telling you, why do you keep listening? <laughs> but many of us have cultivated the habit of listening to the devil. Guilt is one of the most destructive, deadly things in the world. It's the cause of much sickness and much mental illness. And I have to say it, but the tragic thing is that people can sit in most of our churches, even evangelical churches, and nurture a sense of guilt. And after about ten years, they go to a psychiatrist, and he diagnoses their problem, a guilt complex. But in ten years in church, they never got through to the stage of feeling righteous. Some people would feel condemned if they weren't guilty. Do you know that? <laughs> I meet many people. Actually, they feel guilty if they're not feeling guilty. <laughs> this is, I, it may sound comical, but it is true. You meet somebody who says, there's no condemnation, I'm free, God has got nothing against me. Well, you almost think that he's being presumptuous. This is comical, but it is true. I read it in the journals of John Wesley just to show you the attitude of religious people on this point. When the Wesleys first began to go up and down the British Isles preaching, one of the places that they stormed was the county of Cornwall, the furthest southwest area of the British Isles. And in Cornwall there was a man who was a church member and no more, and he heard John Wesley preach. And he accepted this simple fact that God was willing to forgive his sins. And he believed and his sins were forgiven. Now, to you, to the you here in America today, this sounds almost unbelievable, but it's a correct historical record. When he went around testifying that he knew his sins were forgiven, he was treated as a blasphemer. And actually, they eventually punished him by press-ganging him into the Navy. That's what he got for telling people he knew his sins were forgiven. Now, you wouldn't react like that, but many of you, actually, you'd be slightly shocked if you met a person that was not living under condemnation. There was no shadow, no guilt, no regret. There's a, two or three people here. One is a Catholic priest that were helping. Together, we were praying for a lady to be delivered from evil spirits. Just the other day, and if the lady's here, I'm in not any way going to reveal her identity. And all the dark, miserable demons that came out, fear, guilt, condemnation, self-righteousness, all the old miserable list, and then came regret. And this one struggled and struggled. It did not wish to let go of its prey. Now, there are three witnesses here. One is a Catholic father. And I believe you'd agree with me. I'm not exaggerating the least bit in what I tell you. How many of you are a prey of regret? How many of you know what it is to live without a shadow from the past over your lives? How many of you have ever made that decision that Paul made, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before? I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There is a place in God which is the inheritance of the saints in light. There is not one dark shadow that can fall across that inheritance because the cross has shut them off. I wonder if you're living there tonight. You know the great reason why Jesus walked this world unruffled, untroubled, undefeated, never hurried, never flurried, never worried. You know why? Because he had no sense of guilt. He could look the world in the face. He could meet Satan straight on 
and walked towards him with perfect calm, knowing that the devil had to yield before the spotless righteousness of the Son of God. And his is the righteousness which is imputed unto us by faith. Stop trying to make yourself righteous. Don't make the mistake the Jews have made for 19 centuries. Paul says in the 10th chapter of Romans, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of the righteousness of God and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. And there are multitudes of professing Christians who theoretically accept the doctrine of grace, but have never entered into it experientially, and they are still, like the Jews, going about trying to establish their own righteousness making themselves a little better, turning over a new leaf, keeping rules under human regulations. You've got to be at so many meetings every week, just like our good Baptist brother. Friend, that is not the liberty of the Holy Spirit. That's a human bondage. Has it ever occurred to you that in almost every epistle Paul wrote, he could begin by thanking God for the people to whom he was writing? Even the Corinthians, with adultery and all sorts of problems in the church, he said, I thank God for the grace of God which is given unto you. But when he came to the Galatians, he didn't have time for any thanks. It's really remarkable. Soon as he got over the salutation, I marvel that he has so soon turned away from the grace of God into another gospel. What was their problem? Immorality? No. Drunkenness? No. Worldliness? No. You know what it was? Going back under the law. He regarded that as a much more serious problem than the sins of the flesh. And many people who wouldn't go to a nightclub or a cabaret they'd do better dancing. <laughs> like the prodigal son, they've never learned to be merry. If all you've got is misery, don't preach it to the world, they have enough of their own. <laughs> Just like our brother saying, he'd been living right next to it and never entered into it. Son, all that I have is thine and thou art ever with me. And all he was was miserable. And he wanted others to be as miserable as he was. And that's typical of religious people. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> I would point out to you in the 8th verse of the 2nd chapter, Paul having unfolded this wonderful plan of redemption through Jesus Christ and the cross, says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, cheat you by getting you back into philosophy. And as a former professional philosopher, I would tell you philosophy is a very dangerous field for a Christian. In my opinion, you'd better keep out of it altogether. The moment I was saved, for my part, this is purely personal, I ceased to be a philosopher. Because as a philosopher, I was looking for the answer. When I got saved, I knew I'd found the answer. I'm reminded of the words of a certain preacher... In relation to what I said just now, you've probably heard this. I don't know who he was, but he was a friend of a friend of mine. And he spoke about his conversion in these terms. He said, and he'd been like me, I'm ashamed to say, a heavy drinker and a very regular dancer. I would be out five nights a week dancing. And if I got home at dawn, I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. And yet religious people, if they're not out of the prayer meeting by 9.30, they're upset. <laughs> the world takes its pleasures far more seriously and more enthusiastically than the Christians enjoy their religion. <laughs> Anyhow, this friend of mine, to cut this reference short, but it always appeals to me, he said, when I got converted, I didn't stop drinking, I just changed the brand. And then he said, and I didn't stop dancing, I just changed the floor. And that's my testimony. I mean to keep on dancing. Not all the time, but I don't mean to stop. When the prodigal came back, you know what he heard? The elder brother, music and dancing. And it made him mad. And I've told people that get mad about music and dancing in the church. Now, I'm not talking about the kind of dancing where you have a partner. I'm talking about the kind of dancing that David did before the ark. He had no partner. I was out there, I think this was this, this famous November seminar of last year, 
And I'll tell you, when the Spirit of God fell upon those Jews and those Arabs and the Americans and the Scandinavians, they all started to dance. All of them. And we had Jews dancing with Arabs <laughs> and Americans. And there was an Episcopal priest there, a good friend of mine, Father Sherwood, who's known to some of you, I'm sure. He's, he's up in his 80s. And he was, he turned loose like the youngest. <laughs> and he had his, what we call his dog collar on, and of course in that area that's uh, what they call a gasis a, a padre, a very reverent person and after a little while I noticed him dancing with a lady and I had to tiptoe up to him and say Father Sherwood in this country a priest wouldn't be seen dancing with a lady so he was very gracious about it he looked around for somebody else to dance with <laughs> I know he doesn't mind my telling that story I've told it in front of his face before now there is a place in Christ where you're liberated. You don't use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. You don't become a stumbling block to others. But you're not going to let religious tradition and the opinions of people that don't have as much as you have keep you from enjoying what you've got. Now I want to go on. Verse 9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's Christ. And ye are complete in him. That's wonderful news. In Christ we have everything we need. Who is the head of all principality and power. These foolish Colossians were beginning to seek to spiritual entities out in the unknown spiritual realm to help them. Like the Galatians, they were beginning to observe times and laws. Like the modern Americans, they were beginning to turn to diviners and fortune tellers and teacups and horoscopes. And Paul said, don't you realize you've got it all in Christ? He's far above these weak, petty, unworthy powers that you're seeking to, for help. You're complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Under the old covenant there was a circumcision of the flesh. But under the new covenant, there is what Paul calls a circumcision not made with hands, which is the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh. Paul says about this same body in Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be nullified, rendered ineffective. And we are to reckon ourselves in relation to this body dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God. And in Colossians 2, Paul calls the putting off of this body a circumcision, a spiritual circumcision in which the whole of this old evil inheritance and this evil carnal nature is put off like a dead body. And then the next thing that you do after a body has died is what? You bury it. The burial is the baptism of the believer. And baptism, as I said yesterday, or whenever it last, was I last spoke to you, is not a mere religious formality. It is a vital transaction with God. It does things in your life which are not done if you're not baptized. I'll give you my own testimony very briefly on this point. I had a glorious experience of salvation. I've never doubted for one moment, for 28 years, my salvation. I was turned upside down, turned inside out, totally changed. I broke all association with evil things. I made reparation and restitution, which I find many people today don't speak about in relation to conversion. I went back and confessed sins that I'd committed in the most terrible and embarrassing situations. I did everything I could to undo the evil that I'd done in my unregenerate condition. I do not doubt the reality of my salvation for one moment. And from that moment, Sin's power over me, its control, its dominion was broken. But there still remained in my mind many mental images and associations from the past life. And then the British Army sent me overseas and I spent nine months in the deserts of North Africa as a British soldier without seeing even a paved road for nine months. Then the army granted me the privilege of leave and I applied and went to Jerusalem. And that's the first time I ever saw Jerusalem in 1942 and I fell in love with Jerusalem then and I'm still in love with Jerusalem today. 
And I'm glad that there's a special blessing in the scripture for those that love Jerusalem and pray for her peace. And I qualify for that, and I thank God I enjoy it. And there I met some assemblies of American Assemblies of God missionaries. Brother and sister Paul Benjamin, who might be known to some of you, now live in Pacific Grove in California. And these tactless Assemblies of God missionaries began to speak to this Anglican about baptism. And I didn't feel the least enthusiasm about baptism. On the other hand, I was sufficiently clear-headed to see that there was something there in the Bible that had no remote connection with whatever had happened in my infancy. And I had learned that the Bible is true and you better obey it. Amen. So on the 24th of August, 1942, I had the privilege of a Jordan baptism. I didn't consider it a privilege. I've met many since. They say, oh, how wonderful. For me, it was a death. It really was a death. I felt miserable going down. They entired me in a black robe, and Pastor Benjamin immersed me. And I have the evidence, because there are, I have two photographs. One of me standing in the water there, with my head above the water, and the next one, where my head was, there's just a splash. And that's my evidence. <laughs> so I was baptized in obedience to the Word of God. Not as the result of any emotion, whatever. And I didn't really expect anything. I just thought, I've done it, it's over with. But about a month later, I suddenly realized those evil mental pictures and associations were not in my mind any longer. And I realized now, the body had been dead for nine months, but it had been lying around unburied. And an unburied dead body is an offense by anybody's standards. And that's what the unbaptized believer is. He's left a dead body lying around unburied. As I said to you the other day in the New Testament, and if you think I plan to preach this when I stood up here this evening, you're mistaken. But I'm telling you that the Lord is dealing with people here about water baptism. And you better give heed. I've known people that had the light in water baptism, fooled around with it, and lost the light on it. That's the most serious thing that can ever happen. Cease to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. I realized that my old body had been buried. It was out of sight. And you know what they say in the old proverb? Out of sight, out of mind. That's what it was. Something happens when you're baptized as a believer in faith in Jesus Christ, which does not happen unless you are baptized. God has got no superfluous twiddles in the gospel. Now you say, Brother Prince, do you want me to be baptized into your church? I don't have a church. You are not baptized into a church. You're baptized into Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the things that grieved me in Africa was every time a convert joined a new mission, he was rebaptized into that mission. Out of the Assemblies of God, into the Church of God, out of the Church of God, into the, some other mission, and so on. Friend, you are not baptized into any mission or any church. If you're baptized as a believer whose sins have been forgiven, you are baptized into Jesus Christ. Amen. You are buried with him by baptism into death. It's the, it's the payment of your last debt to death. Do you know that? When you come up out of that water, you owe debt no more. The last payment has been made. When you come to the end of your physical life, Jesus said, he that believeth on me shall neither see nor taste death. All that death is for you then is the separation of your spirit from your body. But you do not pass under the dominion of that dark angel that John saw in the sixth chapter of Revelation and hell followed with him. Remember, death is a person. And hell is a person. But for the believer whose life is hid with God in Christ, and whose old life has been buried beneath the waters of baptism. That is the end. There's no more. You say, Brother Prince, I don't feel good about it. Maybe not, because it's burial. And I don't know how many people do feel good about burial. I remember in Britain, in the southwest of the country, I went to a group that were just moving into these things, and we held a baptismal service. They had the baptism the baptistry in the floor of the building. And there were steps down to it. And I was in the baptistry waiting for the first person to come down. And it was a lady. And I'd been staying in her house. 
And she got to the top of the steps in her baptismal robe, ready to walk down into the water. And her face, I was watching her, turned ashen gray. And she screamed, turned round and ran out. And we couldn't baptize her. We baptized the others. Later, I spoke to her and I said, whatever made you do that? And she said, as I was walking down those steps, she said, I was not walking into water. She said, I was walking into an open grave, and it scared me. But that's the truth. It is. It's walking into the grave. The natural man will always feel a certain revulsion from the grave, but it's the way into the resurrection. Buried with him in baptism. Verse 12 of Colossians 2, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Notice it's through faith. It's through faith in what God can do. It's your testimony of faith that like as God raised Jesus from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, he can raise you out of your old life to walk in newness of life by the same power that raised Jesus from the tomb. Now we come to the culmination of the work of the cross in three further statements. And I promise you with this I will close. How I'm going to close I haven't a clue at the moment. <laughs> But we'll see what will happen. I'm going to read the 13th, 14th, and 15th verses. And you, being dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he, God, quickened, made alive, together with him, Christ, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled or stripped principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Three things are here stated by Paul to have been achieved by the cross. First of all, the forgiveness of all our trespasses. The death of Jesus on the cross made it possible for a just God, without compromising his divine justice, to forgive every sin that you or I had ever committed. Modern Christians, especially in certain Protestant denominations, Talk as though they question the right of God to punish the sinner. As though this was a problem. They are most completely mistaken. God's problem is not how to punish the sinner. God's problem is how to forgive the sinner. Justice demands the punishment of the sinner. I heard of a man who said once, all I want is justice. If that's all you want... You'll get it. The wages of sin is death. The just punishment for sin. The due reward is death. It would be unrighteous of your employer if you worked for him for a week for a fixed salary at the end of the week to withhold your salary, your wages. And it would be equally unrighteous of God to withhold the punishment due to us for our sins. His justice would be compromised. The universe would no longer be a stable or orderly place in which we could live. The problem with God is stated by Paul in Romans the third chapter that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Not how to, for, how to punish, but how to forgive. How can God forgive the sinful person without compromising his righteousness. There's no way but by the cross. Because on the cross, our sins were justly and duly and totally punished in the person of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something else while I say this. Remember this. And I have known people get so mad with this statement that they've walked out of the meeting. But it happens to be true. God does not owe to you and me the gospel. It is of grace, not of death. Now listen to me carefully, and you rise up in arms against this statement, but you turn it over in your mind and get quiet about it. It's true. God's justice would not have been compromised if the whole world had been consigned to damnation without an offer of mercy. See that? I trust the lawyers here can appreciate it. That's why lawyers usually become good preachers, because they can grasp the fundamental facts, the legal facts on which the gospel is based. Some of the greatest preachers have been lawyers, and I trust we've got some more here. You have to grasp this. It requires a clear, logical mind. Everything that's offered in the gospel is of grace. And grace is affirmed to be not 
by debt. It isn't owed. If you want what's owed, it's wages. It's judgment. That's justice. But if you don't want your wages, then you have to accept grace. Free, unmerited pardon. Not received on the basis of what you have done. But, oh, glory to God, received simply by believing in God. To him that worketh not. Religious people listen to that. There must be many of you here tonight. You're probably good church members. But do you know you're saved? Do you know you're saved? And if you don't, you know your big problem, you're trying to earn it. Listen, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. If you want to be saved, the first thing you've got to do, you know what it is? Stop doing anything. To him that worketh not, don't go and join the church, get baptized, get confirmed, turn over a new leaf, counsel with a minister. Stop doing anything. And when you come to the end of all that you can do, and you realize you're a lost and helpless sinner, just believe in Jesus. And God will freely justify you by His grace. We talk about grace, but my conviction is the majority of Protestants haven't got the faintest understanding of what grace really is. And they enjoy precious little of it. And you know why they enjoy so little? Because they're trying to earn it. And they're kind of tossing up. Now, did I pay my tithes? And did I do this? And did I do that? And maybe I qualify for a little grace. No, my friend. <laughs> Never that way. Not with all your struggles will you ever qualify for one little fraction of the grace of God. All right. All our sins can be forgiven through the cross. Fourthly, in the, secondly, in the 14th verse. And this is a revolutionary doctrine itself today. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way. You know what Jesus did on the cross? Secondly, he blotted out the law. Did you know that? Few Christians realize that. We are not under the law, but under grace. And you cannot be under both. Romans 6, 14, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. The implication is clear. If you were under the law, Sin would have dominion over you. Well, then you say, why did God give the law? The answer is to show you what a sinner you were. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Why was the commandment given? That sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. That all the hideousness of sin might be redeemed. I find then a law, Romans 7, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. You never know how bad you are until you try to be good. And when you've discovered how bad you are, the law has done its job. And after he struggled through the law, and all of a sudden, the chapter of Romans, all Paul could say was, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And he said, I thank my God there is a way out through Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans 10, 4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. He's not the end of the law as a part of the word of God, but he's an end of the law as a means of righteousness. Ephesians 2.15, he has abolished in his flesh the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Don't leave out the Ten Commandments. They're an integral part of the law that's been abolished. I hope you heard that. The fourth chapter of Deuteronomy, when Moses sums up the law, he tells Israel very clearly, you must not add to it, and you must not take away from it. When God gave the law, he gave it by one man, Moses. John 1, 17. The law, the law, the whole law was given by Moses. And it was abrogated in Jesus Christ. Not part of the law, but the whole law. So many Christians think they've got to be by little bits of the law. And the strange thing is they all choose those little bits that happen to suit them, you know. Well, I don't do this, but I do do that. You know what James said, the second chapter, the tenth verse? Whoso keepeth the whole law, yet offendeth in one point, he is guilty of the entire law. One point of guilt makes you guilty of the entire law. You know what it says in Galatians, the third chapter? 
If you once start keeping the law, listen, if you once begin to keep the law, cursed be every man that continueth not in all the words of this law to do all that is written therein. You're under a curse. The moment you start to keep the law, if you don't keep it completely and entirely. No wonder Paul got excited about the Galatians. No wonder he couldn't thank God for them. That was their problem. Going back under the law. He said, Brother Prince, convince me that this includes the Ten Commandments. I'll do it. Listen, the 14th verse of this chapter says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances was against us, which was contrary to us. You know why it says handwriting? You remember whose finger wrote the law? The Ten Commandments? God wrote it with his own finger, and no one but God could blot it out. And then it says, as a result of this, in the 16th verse, let no man therefore judge you in respect of meat or drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath day. And let others say what they will, but my Bible tells me I'm not to let anybody judge me in respect of observing the Sabbath. And I don't. And if by any chance you should happen to think that Sunday is the Sabbath, then, my good friend, you're a fearful Sabbath breaker. Because you walk far more than the prescribed distance to go to church or travel in your automobile. And you carry that heavy Bible under your arm. And you light all sorts of, kindle all sorts of fire. If you're going to do it, do it properly. And remember this, included in that law of the Sabbath is that you stone the Sabbath breaker. Don't forget to do that. <laughs> you think this is a little thing. It isn't. I'm not pushing my books, but if you've never read the second book, you get hold of that and read it, because there's about five chapters. Christians have failed to understand that we've got to know our relationship to the law, otherwise we cannot live in grace. That's why the law is right in the middle of the epistles. Because I'll tell you, the nature of human being is such that if he could ever justify himself without God's grace, he'd always prefer to do it. <laughs> we only turn to God's grace when we prove we can't do it otherwise. Actually, this is the essential nature of sin. The essential nature of sin is the desire to be independent of God. And this is not dealt with until it's dealt with by our failing to live up to the law. We come to God as miserable failures. And it's the law that's made us miserable, but not grace. <laughs> Forgive me, you may think otherwise about this, and we'll remain friends. But at any rate, in my childhood, I grew up in the church which taught us to say every Sunday morning, pardon us, miserable offenders. Now, I'm not making fun of this. I'm stating objectively my reaction was this. When I got to the, my teens, you know that troublesome age that some of you are in and others of you have passed through, I thought to myself, if all this religion can do is make me a miserable offender, I can be an offender without religion and not half so miserable. And that's what I decided to do. The law makes you miserable, sure, but not grace. Finally, famous last words. Verse 15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now this is one of the most neglected facts of Scripture Revelation, that on the cross, Jesus defeated once and for all Satan and all his unseen but very real and very powerful forces of evil that are directed against us. They suffered a final irrevocable defeat there when Jesus died on the cross. Why were they defeated? Because the sin question was dealt with. The guilt question was dealt with. Up to that time, had God intervened in judgment against Satan and his hosts, he could have done it, but Satan would have stood and said in the face of Almighty God, and you think that this is improbable, but remember that in the book of Job, Satan came amongst the sons of God and appeared in the very presence of God. And Satan could have stood before God and said, all right, God, I'm a rebel, I'm past repentance, I know my destination, it's that lake of fire and brimstone out there, you can send me there any time. But remember, you're a just God. You know that, and I know that. Men may not know it, but God knows it, and the devil knows it. Neither of them are in any uncertainty about that. You're a just God, and remember, those human beings that I fooled and deceived, they're guilty too. And when you send me to that lake, 
Remember, you've got to send them too. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.